Welcome uh, to the EnviroHouse sponsored webinar. Today we're going to be talking about tree pruning, something I am very terrible at. Um, so hopefully I'll learn some things too, as I always do in these things. So as everyone joins in, I will go over a few things. If you notice uh, in the chat, I'm sorry, as an attendee, you're immediately muted and um, no video camera, web camera, so we can just control that right now. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can throw them in the chat down here. And make sure you, if there's a little drop down that says for all panelists or all panelists and attendees, uh, please put it on all panelists, panelists and attendees so everyone can see your questions. You can also use the Q&A function where you can add a question that we can answer either on the air or uh, just in a message. I will be monitoring the chat as well as our guest who is uh, Jenny Call today. Um, and we'll keep an eye on those things and we'll be able to reply and communicate. So if you have any questions. Also, if you do have any technical issues, please be sure to put them in the chat if you can. Obviously, if you have a technical issue where something's not working right, um, we can't see that. But anyway, uh, if we do have any technical errors that happen on our part, something uh, bad audio or bad video or the whole system shuts down for some reason we will um we'll do everything we can to get you back up and running as quickly as possible and um also this is being recorded so we will have this available at the end of it uh we'll get it up on the air or on the web shortly after it's recorded maybe a couple of days so um why don't i turn it over to janda welcome everybody thank you um and welcome this will be our um, next to last webinar for this year, unless I come up with one more yet, um, we will be doing one on the 18th on electric vehicles. Um, that is on the Vera House website. You can sign up now. Um, for today, we are going to do fruit tree pruning, which is a little bit different than landscape pruning, which is what we did last week. Um, and that one was recorded and it will be up on the website. All the ones that we're doing are recorded so you can go back to the website and find those and replay them. Um, for today, Jenny Call is going to talk to us about fruit tree pruning and um, a little bit on the care of fruit trees and the tools that you use and that sort of thing. She's representing Garden Sphere. Um, we will be talking at the end of it um, and I'll just mention it now. Um, the um, tree coupon program for Tacoma Pierce County. It's sponsored by the city of Tacoma and um, Tacoma Power. And I believe there's another sponsor in on that. Um, there is a coupon that you can get for $30 off per tree, up to three trees from participating nurseries. Garden Sphere is one of those participants. And we will get that information to you at the the end of the webinar. So stick through it and you can learn more about how you can get fruit trees. Uh, one quick thing, Jenny, before we get started in Janda, um, I, we are going to have polls throughout this uh, webinar. Um, I forgot to do the first one, which is how did you hear about us? Um, so I'm going to launch that and let everybody in attendance go ahead and check this one out. Please answer. Uh, I'll give you about 30 seconds to go through it. While we are doing that, make sure you vote. Um, what website did you mention there, Janda? Uh, for the webinars? The, um, Enviro House uh, workshop page. It's cityoftacoma.org forward slash workshops. Workshops. Thank you. I will put that in the chat for somebody. I'll give you about five more seconds to look at the poll. Looks like almost everybody is, in, is being counted. I know we have a few mail-in ballots coming in right now, so uh, we'll get to that. Just kidding. Here we go. <laughs> Shut it down in three, two, one. And let's take a look at those results real quick. You can see where those all came from. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. There's something called social media Facebook thing. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Well, let's turn it over to Jenny. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for joining us. And uh, we'll be here if you need us. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, we are gonna be talking about pruning your fruit trees. And um, just a little bit about me, I am a Pierce County native. Um, I grew up in Fife. Imagine Fife as farms. That's how I grew up. Um, and and my grow, growing up also with the um, organic 
pro uh, processes um, and caring for landscape and food that we eat. I have a degree in sustainable agriculture and I have been with Garden Sphere since 2012. I can't leave there, it's fantastic, we're like family. Um, I, I absolutely have a passion for these subjects. I love questions, um, I feel like you know, we learn from each other. I learn from you, you learn from me, and we all learn more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of start this process. Um, I want you to keep in mind um, how how and why you think this is going to be applicable to to your yard and your landscape and say your fruit trees. OK, so keep that kind of in the back of your mind. and. Think about how you're going to use these new skills and this, this new information um, in your practice at home. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So, so again, this is a fruit tree and pruning, caring for those fruit trees as you you do this. Um, Again, I'm, I'm with Garden Sphere. Um, we, have a, we have a really good time. Um, see if I can get this to move forward. Perfect, all right. So when and why to prune? So fruit trees, and that's all fruit trees, um, and that includes you know, your, your, your blueberries, your, some of your bushes as well, and some of your native um, bushes and plants, um, you're, you're gonna wanna prune them. January and February are the best. So you're thinking they are asleep, they're dormant, um, you, they have no leaves, all of that energy is down into the root system and there's no sap running. Um, you're gonna wanna be pruning, today we're gonna mostly talk about our palm fruits. Palm fruits are your apples and your pears, your Asian pears, um, and then your stone fruits, which are your cherries, plums, peaches, nectarines, um, all those goodies. All of these things benefit from annual pruning. We are going to talk about a few oddballs too at the very end that, <laughs> that are unique um, in, in the, with a pruning situation. Um, I do want to note that plums and cherries, um, they benefit from a late summer pruning. But again, you're only going to prune them once a year. So if you prune them in, you know, midwinter, you're not going to want to prune them again in the late summer. So pick a time to do it. And maybe you want to split your work too. Maybe you want to split how much you're doing. Say you have lots of palm fruit and you're like, okay, if I do the stone fruit, if I do those plums and cherries um, in late summer, and really it's the plums and cherries. If I do those in late summer, then I have less work to do in the cold later uh, in January and February. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to split that work up. Um, but they really benefit. You're going to find you're going to have more fruit. Um, you're going to have more even growth with the plums and cherries when you prune them in late summer. Pruning is done to encourage fruit production keeps that pest load really low and your disease load really low. Um, and that's what you want, because if you're, you have lots of pests and lots of disease, that fruit is just not going to work for you. And, and that's why we have these fruit juices, so we can eat all this wonderful, juicy, luscious fruit. Um, and you want to prune it, you know, as a as a offhand aesthetically, right? You don't want a crazy fruit tree that's getting into everybody's way. Um, you do want to kind of keep it reined in. Um, we're going to go over different sizes and we're going to go over the different shapes of of pruning these fruit trees. So keep in mind, um, you know, how do you want this fruit tree to look? Especially if you're new to the planting, you, it's a young tree. How do you want it to look? when it's full size, you know, eight feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, 25 feet tall, depending on the type of tree you've selected. Um, yeah. I do have a quick question here in the chat, if you don't mind. Um, it pertains to pruning, of course. Um, purple Cherokee crabapple not pruned since planting. Many branches are mostly horizontal drooping at ends, around two to three inches in diameter. May I prune hard as if restarting training? Ooh, um, how, my question would be, how old is the tree? And if it is three or more years old, then you can do a hard prune. And we'll go over that too. Um, if, if it's, if, you know, it's 
gone through three seasons, you absolutely can do a hard prune and you're going to want to do a hard prune. You're going to cut back 50% of that tree um, and those branches. And, and then you can really start shaping it. Um, some of the, this, this really ties into um, shaping the tree. So we have some ways to, to think about the shape of the tree as a mature tree and how you're going to prune it to get that effect. So we have a central leader, modified central leader, and then you have your open center vase. Now the central leader is going to be a nice openly branched tree, lots of airflow, a little bit on the taller side in the center, right? You want that nice strong leader. And then you have that modified central leader, which kind of looks like a fan. I like to think of it as more of a fan when you look at it directly on. Um, it's very even, it's very balanced. Um, so it's it's a nice shape because I feel like with the modified central leader, you tend to be able to reach that fruit more easily. Um, if it happens to be a semi dwarf or a standard tree, um, the open center vase shape is my go to. I got to tell you, it's my go to, especially with my palm fruits, the, uh, the pears and the apples, not so much with those stone fruits, the, the cherries and the plums, nectarines, peaches, um, but for those palm fruits, the apples and the uh, pears, um, the European pear, not the Asian pear, um, I really feel like you get more light, you get more airflow, you have your pest load is less. Um, it also can keep that tree at a nice, comfortable height for, um, for harvesting too. And we're ready for our first poll question. <laughs> Excellent. Here it comes. And the question is, have you used pruning tools before? Simple yes or no here. Go ahead and vote. Pick your answer, I guess. Give you about. Mm, I'm so curious about this. Right. We got about 75% of the vote in. So uh, a few more people. Come on, you can do it. Just one more. Yeah. Just a few more. To use the tools. There we go. We're getting up there. All right. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. No judgment here either. There's no judgment here at all. You know, if you've uh, never used them, that's cool. <laughs> right. And if you've used them for things other than pruning, that still counts as using pruning yeah. tools, right? All right. Here we go. Yes. Let's take a look at these numbers. <laughs> There's your results. Wow. That's great. Cool. 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 Okay. So that is super helpful. So we've got like 24 percent who've never used pruning tools before and that's totally okay and uh, about 76 percent who have used pruning tools before this is really great i really love seeing that um we are going to get into um the different types of tools so some of your basic 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 tools that you're going to use um, you're going to want to have a bypass pruner and or an anvil pruner. Now, I gotta tell you the biggest difference between your bypass pruner and your anvil pruner are the teeth. Now, the anvil pruner is gonna have these ridges on it. They are, um, so you'll notice it's very flat right here. That also causes the sharp edge of the blade to set a little bit inside of that, that groove teeth and really the anvil is you're really going to want to use that for like dead wood hard dead wood now that bypass pruner you're going to get nice clean cuts with that and you're going to want to use it with the the fresh live branches right okay and depending on the the bypass pruner you have could you know you could be able to um lop off you know, a two inch, three inch diameter branches, depending on what kind you have. You know, we've got the long handle and the, and the uh, short hand tool. So um, you've got the hand pruners. So those are really great. Um, ratcheted as a hand pruner can really be helpful um, if you have arthritis, because it really takes a lot of the work out of it, the muscle work out of it. And that ratchet can really be helpful. Um, Loppers, so think of a bypass pruner with like two foot handles, right? So that, that's what we kind of consider a lopper, right? You're going to be able to take that, that one and a half inch to three inch diameter branches and really get those down. Now, there are some really cool ones that are telescoping and you can um, 
lengthen those handles so that the handles become large, longer and you don't need to be on a step ladder or anything. And it's just, it's so cool. I really like the telescoping. Um, I actually have a pair and they're fantastic. Now we have a pruning saw and we have a, a uh, which is super handy. Um, I'm gonna kind of go to the next slide so we can see some of these. And then the pole saw. Um, so here's the anvil and you can really see that there's a little, there's a little lip here and it, that blade really comes over. And if you use that on fresh um, live branches, you are more likely to get a snag and we don't want any snags. I like to think of them as hangnails on a plant. Um, this is going to be your long handled bypass pruner. Super handy. I love it. You don't have to get on a step ladder. Now the telescoping even better. Now you can get telescoping uh, bypass pruners that are um, very light. They have some great materials they make them out of now. Uh, and I just, I really like them a lot um, because it really, the handles go up, you know, you can make them shorter, you can make them longer, super versatile. Here is our saw. Now I have had my saw, gosh, um, at least 15 years. Now, this is, I have I actually have this particular brand, this Corona saw, and it is rusty, but man, this saw, I tell you, it's one of the best tools. You can keep it in your, in your back pocket or in a tool belt as you're working, and it is just gangbusters. You get a big branch, you got to get that branch out of here. You don't need anything more. You don't need a chainsaw. You just get this handsaw and use that. Um, we have a couple others here. Um, the the long handled um, uh, pruning the pole pruners, okay. Um, pole pruners are great. So you can see right here that we've got the pruner and we have the saw. Now I I really in particularly like these two items to be separate. So if you have a pole pruner that has an attachment with the saw, I really recommend taking off that saw if you know you're just not going to use it. Or getting two long handles and sticking the saw on one and keeping the pole pruner on the other. The thing is, is that the saw really gets in the way. Um, it can snag onto other branches. It can cause damage. Um, especially if you are pruning site um, and has a lot of branches in there, that saw, I tell you, just gets in the way. So if you can somehow get two poles and separate those out, go for it. Otherwise, be very careful. Um, this is, again, the same type of saw that is on this hand saw. Um, it's very sharp. I have cut my fingers, and boy, oh, boy, it hurts. Um, they go deep. They're very sharp. It's, it's um, jagged, um, multi-teeth. So... Be very careful with that. Um, and then here's our handy dandy little um, uh, bypass pruner. Love this thing. Uh, I have like four or five of them. I want you to take a look at how simple this, this um, spring is. Now, the reason I like this style of hand pruner is because this piece right here, less than 50 cents to replace. You can get a box of, of six for like 250 and they do rust out after a year or two and so when you're sharpening your tools you can replace your spring so simple and easy to take care of again get a bypass get an anvil pruner that is just connected with screws um, and a simple spring because these are going to be very easy to take apart sharpen and clean for the next season okay very easy tools to use. Um, are, are there any questions about uh, the various pruning tools? We don't have any at this time. Okay, good. I'll keep an eye up, but fantastic. I, it's good information. I'm learning a lot. So yeah, this, it's a lot. <laughs> it is. It's good. <laughs> if you had to pick two tools to purchase, right? You're out there. You're buying two tools. Honestly, start out. Get the bypass pruner and get a, get a handsaw. If you have to start out, if you're just starting from scratch, then if you have a little bit of extra cash, get the long handle bypass pruner. Those three will get you by in any situation because although these are meant, the bypass pruners are meant for that fresh live cut, it'll work on the dead wood too. It'll dull your blade faster, but you can do it. So these are the three I would recommend. Uh, if you if you are out purchasing something just getting started with pruning. Um, when you're pruning, some of the really key things to think about is 
how often are you sharpening your tools? How often are you cleaning your tools? Now, when you're pruning fruit trees, it is so important. Just keep a cotton ball and a little Ziploc bag with you. And as you go between tree to tree, you're gonna want to just swipe some, some alcohol on there. It doesn't have to be 91, 70 works fine. Um, swipe some alcohol. You wanna just clean up that tool. So you're not transferring any disease from one tree to another tree. And it can be really benign and you don't even know you're doing it. And then another, like then all of a sudden now you've got, you know, a disease on a tree that you never had before. And it's like, oh man, I forgot to disinfect. So, so you really have to be careful with the disinfection, you know, keeping them nice and sharp and disinfecting those tools. We're ready for another poll. Okay, let me get, let me get this started. Uh, real quick on that, um, are, is, tree cross-contamination common? But it is more common than you would think it would be. Um, and okay. a lot of times the trees take care of it themselves. So you're not actually seeing that contamination transfer. But as trees get older, they're just like, um, as people get older, their immune systems change. And so their, their systems change too. And so they're more susceptible, the older the tree, the more susceptible they are to uh, disease. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Um, obviously, people are jumping down on the poll. What is your experience in pruning fruit trees? Yeah. About half, a little over half have uh, gave us their ans given us their answers. Um, as a sustainability kind of person, I'd like to also say that if you are looking for tools, if there's a local tool library in your, in your community, make sure you check those for great resources. But it sounds like it's important to clean them before you use them and clean them before you send them back. Just always be prepared. Yeah, cleaning is important. Uh, someone did ask. Uh, can you use wipes to clean your tools? Now, I don't know specifically what kind of wipes, but is that, is there? You know, you, it's a disinfectant wipe. So really, yeah, I mean, that's that's cool. Yeah, because you could use it multiple times, right? Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's a disinfectant of some sort. Um, bleach won't hurt. I mean, those bleach disinfectants, they won't hurt um, using okay. a wipe or whatever. Yeah, you just want to make sure you're cleaning it with some kind of disinfectant each use. Excellent. All right, let's start stop the polling here and take a look at the results. What do we got? Never pruned before. Okay. Prune bef been, I've been pruning before a few. Okay, you have some problem trees out there. All right, about 20% refresher and then other. What was the other? We have one person who did other. Uh, done some pruning. Let's see, done some pruning, but don't really feel like I know what I'm doing. Oh, okay. I am also in that same boat for me. <laughs> it's you know it's it's always trial and error, and sometimes I I I make some choices in my pruning, and I look back and I go, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> I think for me, I think I'm like the guy with the bonsai trees, like I have to be very fragile, and I'm I'm terrible at it. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, pruning can cause anxiety if you're not used to just getting in there and getting those branches out. Um, so some proper ways to cut your trees. We've got some, several different pictures here. Now, again, I cannot emphasize this more. Sharp tools, disinfect, okay? So before you start pruning, make sure all your tools are nice and sharp and nice and clean. You know, a good rule of thumb is when you're done pruning for the day, go in there, Give your tools just a sharpening up. That way you don't have to sharpen before you start pruning because you might, you know, you'd be take 20 minutes depending on how many tools, you know, and sharpening and not getting to your pruning. And then there goes the day. Um, you kind of want to make sure they're sharp because you want quick, smooth cuts. Okay. No hangnails. Now you see this picture down here. It says too rough. That's what I'm talking about. A hangnail. See that little tongue. Yeah, that's an anvil pruner for you. You know, you get too too big of a diameter of branch and you get a hangnail or you haven't put the branch far enough into that tool. You want to really get that branch all as far in on that tool. You don't want to just be cutting on the ed, end section of the tool. You want to really get it in there um, so you get that nice clean cut. Um, you're cutting above a bud. So right here, we have a nice little bud here. It's a cutie, he's a small little bud, but we are cutting above that bud. Um, we're not cutting below that bud. Now there are some 
some variations there and we will talk about it um, as we get deeper into cutting and I'll show you some examples. Um, but you can see that it's above the bud and you know, you're playing a guessing game here a little bit, you know, you eyeball it, you know, it's about an eighth to a fourth, somewhere in there, you know, and if you need to just look at a ruler really quick and say, oh, wait, that's a fourth. Okay, I can eyeball that on the rest of the trees. Totally fine. This is not an exact science. Okay. If it's a little bit more, if it's a little bit less, totally okay. Don't be hard on yourself. Um, but you definitely want to be above that bud. Yeah. We have a quick question. Uh, yeah. Two questions, but the same idea. What's the best way to sharpen and how do you sharpen tools? That's come on. Yeah, so I could do a whole class on sharpening tools. <laughs> of course, of course. There are so many different sharpening implements to do the sharpening. Um, so there are fancy ones that have all their, they're all different colored little, you know, handheld sharpeners and each one does a different um, uh, hardness um, and you, you do it in a cer certain circular motion. Um, you can just get sharpening stones. Um, and what you're looking for is you're sharpening in one direction. Um, you look for uh, the direction of the, the cut, right? Look at the blade and you're sharpening in that direction. So if it's a bypass pruner, it's down and, down and around, down and around, around that blade. Um, and I always recommend taking it apart so you don't have a half of your of your tool uh, getting in the way while you're sharpening. Um, and it normally just takes a couple of passes. You're looking for a nice, smooth, um, even, and that's why you go all the way through um, with your sharpening stone. Um, you go all the way through that and you go down and around with that bypass. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different with the anvil, but you really look at that blade and you see what direction that blade is going and you just wanna go all the way to the end. You don't wanna make any stops. Uh, excellent. Um, I think Janda, you can maybe book you for a sharpening seminar. Yeah. Before then. Um, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I do have one, one other question here from an Allison. Um, they're asking, can this apply to fig trees? I'm guessing the proper way to cutting. Oh, we'll uh, talk about fig trees. Okay. Okay. Oh, so yeah. we'll talk about fig trees in a moment. <laughs> and just a eyeballs. <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right. You can carry on. So when you're cutting, you're going to want to keep about a 45 degree angle. So again, if you need to look at, at that angle, you know, think 90 degrees and uh, right in the middle, about there. Okay. Um, and then just eyeball it um, above the bud on the high side of the cut. Um, and for larger cuts, um, you're going to go just above the branch collar. Now, right here is where we're seeing before and after pictures of a larger branch and the collar. You can barely see it, but it kind of looks like a ring right around that branch. And that's what we call the collar, okay? So when we're trimming a larger branch, you cut just above that collar, okay? So you're gonna cut right here. And you can see the collar, you can see the collar right here, okay? So we're cutting right above it and we're cutting, making a cut downward, sloped angle away from the trunk, away from that main branch you're cutting that large branch from, okay? Away, because uh, you want that water, uh, you want rain and water and everything to go away from the cut, okay? And that's another reason why um, you're cutting above, you can see right here, this picture here has the bud, cuts above the bud, it's about a quarter inch away and you are cutting at a 45 degree angle away from that bud. The water is running away from it. Now with these collars, it will heal itself. Um, you really wanna leave the collar alone. Just make sure that collar is cut, it's clean, smooth cut, okay? No outside bark hanging off, no hangnails, no, no, no little wood tongues hanging off there, okay? You just want a nice smooth cut and then you're just gonna leave it because you know trees have their, that collar, that collar has all of the properties that are gonna come in and envelop that coat, that, that cut and heal itself. Okay, sap is going to come on. They're gonna, the tree is going to create a seal of its own. Um, I'm just going to run through these really quick. This is too high, too high from the bed. A good cut, but much too high. 
This is a cut that is a good height, but the wrong direction. That bud is going to get bud rot and that fruit is not going to form. Um, this is too close to the bud. Again, it's going to get bud rot and the, the fruit won't form there. No flower will come and we want that flower. That bud is going to create the flower for your fruit. And this is too way too steep, right? That, that cut, the reason why is because now it's created more surface area there. Um, the surface area is increased, which means there's more, um, more, more area for uh, fungus, bacteria, anything to get in there. This one is just a too rough of a cut. This is not a smooth, clean cut. We've got that tongue, we've got that hangnail. So, so here's some, these are great examples. Starting to prune, this is a big one. So brand new tree okay you just planted it you're gonna have to wait until the third season to to cut that that fruit tree back i know it's gonna look ugly it's gonna look like a crazy teenager who doesn't shower it's, your branches are all over the place but you gotta wait because what's happening here is all of this nutrients, the root systems are forming. It's, it's really coming into its own. It's developing those scaffolds, okay? Um, also in those years, you're pulling fruit off. You don't want this tree putting all of its energy into fruit. You want a, that root system to develop. Now on that third season, Cut that thing 50%. Literally, you're going to cut. And this is where some people have a little bit of anxiety, right? You don't really want to cut too much. Cut it back 50%. You're doing the tree a favor. It's got a strong root system. Now it can kind of focus on developing an excellent canopy, okay? Now you're going to want to choose what you're going to do, right? Are you going to have a center leader? You're going to have a modified or you're going to have a, an open vase. This is an open vase, okay? There's no central leader. That central leader has been cut out. We have very strong scaffold branches. Now scaffold branches are these here, okay? They're an excellent distance. They're an appropriate distance apart. You know, you wanna have them, you know, 18, 24 inches apart. And, you know, they, they are balancing out. We're, we're thinking that this tree has got an even balance of scaffold branches. All of your fruit and your growth are going to depend on having a strong scaffold. So I know really, if you got new trees, just, just do it. You, you, can, you can do it, you can cut it 50%. Now, when we're thinking of excellent structure, your tree is now established. Now what we're doing is we're looking for the, initially looking for the three Ds, diseased, damaged, dead. Those are the three Ds. You're gonna cut those out first. Okay, we don't want them there. We don't want them there at all. They're just gonna cause trouble for you down, down the season, okay? You are creating open space and structure when you're pruning. And so when you're creating space, you're allowing more airflow, you're allowing more movement, it decreases your disease and pest load, okay? So we're, here's a great example of, of branches crossing. Right here, what I would do, I would get rid of this branch right here. This is an excellent, strong, straight, nice diameter scaffold. This branch here is just getting in the way. It's crossing, they're gonna end up rubbing together. The bark might get damaged and then you get disease coming in. Here, we, we, these, are, um, these are suckers. And suckers will come up. It's like these stray hairs, you know, that, that don't do anything, but they create leaves and they just, they sap all the energy out of the tree. You're going to get rid of all of these suckers. And suckers, you are actually going to cut all the way down, all the way down as far as you can. These are water sprouts. They're, I like to call them the ground suckers. Get rid of them. Again, they are sapping that energy out of that fruit tree. They are they are harnessing it away from flower production, away from fruit production. They're sapping energy, okay? And then you're gonna just take out any thin, weak branches that are just, you know, they, they look like they might break. They're not really doing anything. They're kind of in the way. Maybe you're mowing and they hit you all the time. Just get rid of it. It's totally fine to do that, okay? Totally fine to do that. Don't feel bad about it because you know you're thinking about the health of the tree. Quick question about the you call them water, water, waterlings, or the I ones like, at the bottom. Yeah, I like to call them uh, the ground suckers, but they're called water sprouts. Okay, um, yeah. is that something 
like do you just clip them at the at the ground level or is it mm -hmm. something like we have to dig them up and you know really get down in there what's the I mean you can if you really got the energy um I don't so. I... <laughs> either I go down as far as I can knowing that they're going to come up every season I'm going to be okay. doing this all season I may even be doing this twice I may be doing it in the spring and then I might be doing it you know in late summer with one of my apple trees I I, I do this twice it, it just happens and what they're doing is they're, they're just sapping energy out of that tree so you're going to go down as far as you can if you want to go just below that soil surface go for it get in there make sure you clean out your uh, your your tool because then again you're bringing that soil bacteria or any fungals or anything that's inside the soil you don't want to bringing it up to your canopy so uh, make sure that you you wash it before you start doing the top again but i would do all of those water sprouts first excellent thank you yes good question what do you leave Hopefully you leave enough of the tree where you get fruit, right? That's the goal, right? So you're going to want to leave that strong leader, okay? Unless you're using that open vase, um, you're going to leave really strong scaffold branches, okay? there. So this is what a 60-degree scaffold looks like. This is a 30-degree scaffold. What's going to happen is that debris, water, all kinds of goodies are going to fall in there, and that's where you're going to end up having um, pest and a disease right in there that's too tight you want those scaffolds at a really nice 45 to 60 degree angle so it keeps airflow there okay you want you want it accessible by light and air um you want you want it at least to be able to get it right so this is a really great scaffold base now spurs spurs on those palm fruits pears um apples asian asian pears okay you are going to want to leave these little these little guys here they're called spurs i think they look like tiny little fingers uh, because he, right at the end here is a bud this is a bud right here that's where your flower and your fruit is going to form okay and you want to leave those on there now you'll notice that there is a difference between a a sucker spur which just ends up giving you leaves and a fruiting spur the the fruiting spur will have similar coloring as the branch it's on okay it's gonna it's going to be have a thicker um a thicker bark now the suckers tend to have a not a very good bud cluster and they tend to look very very tender Okay, they're going to have just a slightly different color. It's not going to look like a, a nice bark. It's going to, it's going to, you know, be a darker color. You know, you're going to be able to scratch it, and you're going to be able to see the inside of that of that sucker. You're going to want to get rid of those. Um, this image here is an excellent example of you have two leaders that are fighting each other. This leader is a lot straighter and it's not doing the curve and that will benefit the tree in the long run and so you would get rid of that if you're looking for that single leader okay now when we're thinking about cleaning out the tree you're really focusing on airflow you know is it damaged diseased okay are, are, you, are you is it dead you know you can see the difference between a, a pre prune and a post prune Okay, we had some crossing over here. We got rid of a branch. I'm um, keeping good spacing in between those scaffolds. They all look about 45 to 60 degrees um, in those scaffolds. Okay, got rid of lots of crossing. Okay, um, suckers are in general going to be straight up. They're going to want to go straight up. And depending on your tree, they're going to be going straight down. And so suckers, you're just getting all the suckers out. Okay, and inevitably every year you're going to have quite a few. Heading back a tree, if the tree is fairly mature, um, you can do some heading back. And it just means, you know, bringing it down a little bit. I have noticed neighborhoods, a lot of people buy fruit trees and then, you know, they let them go. They're really gang ho for the first five years. And then you end up having these massive trees that need to be headed back significantly. And every year it's kind of like it compounds on each other. And so you really want to head that back. It, it's, it's an additional pruning. So you've got the disease 
trees, you got the damage, you got the dead out, you've taken all the suckers out, you've taken all the water sprouts out, um, you know, you're, you've done all that. And now you're just thinking about height, right? If you're doing the, um, the modified leader or you're doing the open vase, you know, you really want to keep that so you can harvest that fruit easily. Okay. It really makes a difference because if you can't get to that fruit and it becomes very cumbersome, the likelihood that you're going to want to take care of that tree is going to go down drastically. So you want to keep it. So you're like, Ooh, I want to eat that fruit. I want to see that fruit. Um, and then you'll be in that tree more often. It takes about 20% of the branches out um, from previous years. Um, and you're, you know, you're looking at that. Um, it doesn't include branches with spurs. Um, you can, you know, it's, it, you might lose some fruit as you bring it down, but it might benefit the tree to have that canopy brought down a little bit, really heading that back. Um, and then it really distributes the weight better. Um, the fruit won't break the branches. Um, you really want nice, strong, strong, strong branches when you do do this. Heading, heading back can, can again, bring up some anxiety because, um, you know, maybe not wanting to bring it back, but you can see, you know, it's, it isn't significant, right? We're just, we're just bringing it in a little bit, cleaning it up. Okay. Another poll. All right, here we go. Um, this one's a good one. Who has espalier? Is that how it's pronounced? Fig yeah. and or, and or stone fruit, uh, fruit trees. You may answer multiple. So vote early, vote often. Um, I do have a question from the chat. Um, yeah. Is are there experts that you can book to get to come to your house to visit um, through? I don't know if it's through Garden Sphere or somewhere. Um, also, um, will this presentation be available afterwards to the attendees? The slideshow. So, just a question there. Give you guys about fifteen more seconds. Yeah. So this is being uh, it's being recorded. So it's it being recorded. Yeah be available um, later um, and then yeah I mean I've I've come out to clients houses and um, what I really like to do is I like to show how to do it and then we share see if you have three trees three fruit trees we share how to do it like I'll do it and you do it type thing and then I say okay third tree I'll watch you do it and I'll be here to facilitate you I'll be your I'll be your coach and I'll be your cheerleader and I'll say oh how about this one or maybe we cut this way you know so it, it's teaching you in the process so you can be more independent with without that but it's i i feel like that's really helpful um and i know the folks at garden sphere um you know all of them are able to do that uh you know and i and i I've, I've done that through garden sphere too so you can give them a jingle um other than that i know that there are a lot of tree services and things like that but i the tree services aren't really going to sh show you and uh facilitate that learning and that growth the way we might do that so sure. it's the classic I do, we do, you do yeah, model, right? Exactly. Yes. Um, I'm going to cancel. I'm going to stop the polling now. So no Supreme Court needed, but end polling. And here's what it looks like. Looks like we have a lot of that. Um, I do a have a follow up stuff. question. Um, I have a short apple tree with crazy long branches out of the sides, mm -hmm. uh, not tall. The same oh, heading good. back apply. Yeah. And then, yeah, how do you get you to your house? I guess call Garden Sphere and they can, you can yeah. work on booking a session. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you'd call Garden Sphere to, to book something. Um, your fruit tree is growing like this. Ooh, I've got tons of arms. Head them back. Um, if, if they are, you know, if they're disease damaged or dead, cut it all the way back to the trunk. Um, if, uh, if they are just long and lanky and they just need a little bit of love, um, just bring them in. You're going to head it back. Um, and it's okay to do that. You know, it's, we're, we're getting into the time to start doing that. So um, as soon as all your trees lose their, um, lose their leaves and we've had a nice hard frost, maybe one or two of those earliest you could do that would be end of December. Okay. I hope that answers that question. Um, now we're starting to get into the oddballs. Okay. Spellier. Spellies are gorgeous. You can train them. Um, they are like a wall. So the branches go horizontally. They go out instead of up. And this picture is kind of interesting because they go horizontal and they go vertical. But it was trained to do that, um, to go on one branch all the way 
uh, horizontal like that. I have seen people use these as fence lines and it is gorgeous. You know, you get four along the front and then you, you train them to intertwine with each other on the ends and then they grow to each other and you have a fence of apple or a fence of pear and it's absolutely gorgeous to look at both while it's blooming and fruiting and in the winter time. I mean, it's just, it looks so cool. Um, they are interesting because you don't cut any of those spurs off. Those main scaffold branches, that's it. Like if they're going horizontal, everything that goes vertical, you're gonna get rid of it. So you're keeping everything that's horizontal, get rid of everything vertical, unless you're training it to do something else. And, and you know, espaliers are really fun to train. Um, you're going to thin it out a little bit. Most of the espaliers are already grafted. Grafted means putting uh, one type of tree onto another type of tree uh, in a rootstock. And so, you know, it's these are also super cool because a lot of them are grafted with multiple types of apples or pears, you know, or plums, anything you want, right? So you get all these varieties on one tree on those single branches. You know, it's a bummer if you lose one of the branches and you lost a variety, but they just are so amazing. Um, but you are gonna leave every single spur on there. I find that the espaliers are very productive. They really, they really produce a lot of fruit. Um, another one on the, uh, I don't, I don't think I have a slide of a vertical or a columnar apple or pear, um, but the columnar, um, think of this centerpiece right here, and then you have these tiny little spurs and these very short branches coming off. It is a column of fruit. The columnar fruits, if you don't have enough space, if even if you only have enough space for a pot on the patio for an apple tree, columnar apples are the best. A, you can harvest those with ease. They, B, they take a very little space. C, very little pruning and maintenance. I mean, they are the cream of the crop, those columnars. And so think of it as just one big column of fruit. Also exceptionally productive. Um, I really, really love the columnar apples. Um, They're just fantastic. Now we get to the figs. Okay, figs, they are their own beast. Figs are just, they're like a wild animal who can't be tamed. Um, <laughs> figs you can cut them all the way to the ground I could cut it all the way down here to the ground and it would still survive and it would still make little babies and we would still have a fig tree I mean it is incredible how easy figs are taken care of you want the fig to you want to shape the fig to look like a bear make it look like a bear you want the fig to be in a column put it in a column um if you want it to be an upright tree with nothing on the bottom and this nice bushy canopy this one's a little broad these are two figs together a little broad looks like they they grew a little bit tippy on each other but you can grow them garden sphere has a fig tree um, on the cor corner of their building produces figs it gets part sun it does not get sun all day um, they're super hardy they you know figs grow well here okay we don't take care of the fig tree at garden sphere i mean it gets pruned up but you know, really takes a beating with all of our carts. So you can ignore a, fruit, a fig tree and it'll still produce fruit. Now raccoons love figs. So if you really want to keep them there, if you have raccoons or squirrels, they will go for those figs. If you might have to do a little bit of netting on top or fencing on the bottom, but they are the best and super, super easy. So I know there was a fig question about how to prune a fig. Prune it however you want to prune it. Um, it will survive anything. I mean, they're just hardy. It's just, yeah, it's unreal. Um, we, when I was talking about those cuts and pruning, and I said, just leave that open cut. I really did mean it. Um, a lot of times you're going to find these products, um, tree wound or a tree sealer of some sort. This is one, uh, one by Tanglefoot called tree wound. Um, these are troublesome. And the reason is, is because it traps in everything. You've made that cut, you've gone and you've pruned the rest of your trees, you've come back to it to kind of put this tree wound on it. 
well now it's been exposed you have now covered up that that really wonderful natural sap that it's producing out you've stunted that heal it will now take exponentially longer for that tree to heal because it has the sealer on there. Not only that, but you have trapped in any bacteria, disease, fungal, any of that. You've trapped it in there and that part of the tree is now super susceptible um, to, da to damage and death. So be becoming a dead area of the tree, which then goes down to the, the, you know, the base of the tree and can damage the root system. So please, if you have this, Please put it in the garbage. <laughs> Your trees will thank you. Um, and, and you know, you really let the tree uh, get, get healing naturally, okay? If you have branches that are, um, they are a tight, they're not quite 45, but they're not quite 30 degrees. You can use spacers, light weights, and you can train those branches and it'll stimulate the growth. Okay, this is, these are smaller branches. They might be a little bit tight in the elbow there. And it stimulates the growth. It, it, as it grows, it also opens up that elbow up. Uh, and gap up. It really opens it up. So you can you can really stimulate the growth there. Um, I want to backpedal just a smidge um, and talk about the uh, the plums and the, uh, the stone fruit. Um, stone fruit again. I, I know I talked about this at the beginning, but stone fruit you can prune at the end of the summer. Um, all of the stone fruit are, are basically done except our Italian prunes. The Italian prunes go a little bit later. Um, and then again, you can, you can prune those in September. It's totally fine. Um, but we're finding that it's, um, it really stimulates some, some healthy growth and they are fruiting more prolifically when they are pruned in the um, late summer, very, very early fall. Okay, opposed to pruning them in um, in the midwinter, you know, January, February ish uh, time frame, um, and that really is just the, the the plums and the cherries. Okay, it's not this is not the nectarines and the and the peaches, um, but it's it's those um, cherries and plums because peaches and nectarines, some of them do fruit quite late here in Washington, and so we want to let them continue doing their thing um, through that fruiting season. Sorry to backpedal a little bit. Um, now you have just pruned, you've done awesome. You know, you feel good about it. Maybe your heart's pounding a little bit. You're feeling a little bit anxiety about like, ooh, did I do too much? Um, but uh, you know, you've got it done. Now you wanna take care of these trees. You wanna nurture them. You wanna keep the pest and disease you know, load low, um, you want to maybe protect the bark, you want to get some pollinators in. Um, some of the sprays and oils you can use while the tree is still dormant, okay, that means it's in winter before it's got, it's got those leaves, the buds open. Do a little lime sulfur, um, horticultural oil um, will definitely keep, uh, keep those rusts and other fungal and bacterial um, diseases at bay. Um, you can do some fruit tree sprays as well, which will um, you know, keep the insects, you know, because sometimes we get some warm days in February and then oof, we've got some eggs that'll pop open and they're ready to go. Um, but it'll, it'll keep those early emergers, um, keep them down. Um, as we go into the season, so you, you see that the, the buds are opening, they're just those, those spurs and everything are just starting to open. So we're thinking, you know, March, end of March, you want to get those apple maggot traps. Here's an apple maggot trap. I got to tell you, they're really sticky, but so worth it. Um, I like to put them on all of my palm fruit. So I put them on my pears and I put them on my apples. I know it's called apple, apple maggot, but I do put it on the pears as well. And it has helped with, with uh, various other types of pests, but those maggots really do go for those pears as well. Um, it super helps. Uh, I put three per apple tree and I put about two in the pear trees. So they do come in packages of three. And so it, you know, you're going to have to get if you have three apple trees, get three packages. You're going to have um, nine balls in all. Um, 
but they're reusable. So you can use them again and again every single season, unless you're like me who's super clumsy and I happen to step on them, <laughs> then I have to go buy some more. But they're, they're made out of a nice durable hard plastic. Um, and so they're easy to clean, use very hot soapy water when you clean it because um, it is quite sticky. Um, but you are going to want to do this at least twice in the season. You're going to do it very, very early in the season. Um, you know, about March, you're going to want to start putting those out. Um, and then I like to do it again, uh, you know, at the beginning of July, I clean them up, put, put, uh, put the goo on there. Um, and you know, you can use Vaseline that works. So you, it's also called tangle foot. Um, and it traps those on um, and I do it in July as well so i'll do it twice because they get pretty full this is a pretty pretty typical what i see at the beginning of july you know that first week of july i see that gator yeah we have a question uh well first a comment someone here their daughter's initials spell f-i-g on purpose Aww. and she's wild and crazy and resilient so <laughs> fantastic Thanks. um and then we have uh, a question from someone uh jack asks we have an Italian prune tree with fungus on the fruit. What can we do about it besides not eat the fruit on it? Yeah, so you might want to do, you know, if you, you're going to have to prune, obviously. Um, once it loses all of its leaves, I would start with a treatment of the horticultural oil. So I would do that maybe in, at the end of December when all the leaves are actually gone because, you know, sometimes you've got some lingerers there. Um, and then hit it again in February after you prune. You don't want to... <laughs> You don't want to put the horticultural oil on it and then prune everything and you're like, oh, I just wasted a bunch of product because <laughs> it, it costs money, right? Um, and that, that's what I would do. I'd hit it again in February. And then when you're starting to put out, um, uh, you know, getting ready for for blooming. Um, so then do it maybe again at the end of March because um, they are kind of a late bloomer. Those Italian prunes, they bloom a little bit later than, than other pr uh, plums, uh, the prune. Uh, so. You could do it again in March um, and then see how it goes. Really monitor it this first year. Um, you're going to really have to monitor it. Um, our summer was very strange. So I am not really surprised that, that you were having that issue. Um, we, we were very wet in the beginning. We didn't quite get hot enough for a long enough period. Um, there happened to be a lot of rot happening. So um, I'm not necessarily surprised about that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That's a bummer. Yeah, that's no fun. Uh, another question came in. Do you have, oh, do they come, I imagine those, the balls, yeah. do they come with extra sticky stuff so you can use once they have been washed? So is it, yeah. is it a one-time use or can you, I mean, a multiple time use, but do you have to get more goo or does it come oh. with a little extra? It does, it comes with a, a bottle of goo and I have found you can use that bottle of goo at least three times before you have to get some more. Um, and then if you don't want to buy some more, if you have that regular petroleum jelly, you know, you can put that on there. It totally works the same, same stuff. Um, the only thing you're not seeing here is the pheromone that gets attached. So there is actually a pheromone that draws in uh, and that's how they get trapped. That's why it's an apple maggot trap. So there is a pheromone that will be attached here. Um, another trap that is going to be super useful, coddling moth. Okay. Those little guys, they are such a pest and they, their larvae go in and they just love to eat our fruit. Um, these coddling moth traps, I put one per tree. Um, unless it's a quite large tree, then I'll put two. But again, again that's going to have to be changed about mid-season. Um, you're going to put it out in March and you're going to want to change it again, probably end of June, beginning of July. Um, this is also kind of cool because it has a grid inside and the grid, you can see your pest load. It'll tell you how to do it. There are directions on how to do it, um, but you can open it back up and you can see, actually see how many you have. And, and then you could, um, you know, after flowering and everything else, give it a hit, uh, you know, of a spray after, afterwards, f after you've figured out your, your pest load there. But I really think this is cool. If you have kids, this is a great science, science edition, at home science edition. Um, figuring out that that pest load. Um, you're trying to protect the, the trunk. Um, you can use hardware cloth or PVC pipe. Um, just make sure it's loose. It doesn't necessarily touch the bark and you will probably have to replace that yearly or bi-yearly um, once it is fully mature. Um, if you haven't gotten into mason bees, 
you are missing out. They are the easiest little critters, friendliest. Um, they are the very early pollinators. And when we have those early plums that bloom, um, these little guys are the ones that go out and pollinate those plums. Um, they do go back into dormancy um, at the beginning of July, but I mean, they are going gangbusters, you know, March, April, you know, May into about mid June, they are pollinating. These little guys are wonderful. So I know we do, um, we put on uh, Mason bee classes here at the Enviro House as well. So um, when that comes up, I, if you haven't gotten into Mason bees yet, you, you gotta check it out. It's so easy and cool. Um, some other things, like if you have deer or rabbit issues, um, I know, you know, some, there are some spots where their deer come in, you, you know, there has been success with this liquid fence, okay? It doesn't harm you, it doesn't harm your pets. Um, it ha you do have to do multiple optications, but after a while, they, the deer really do stay away. Um, a lot of customers have had very good success with that, which is great to know. It's great to know that. Um, I think, uh, if there are any more questions, now would be the time. <laughs> um, I don't see any on the board. Um, okay. Oh, Janda would like to point out that Mason bees do not sting. No. Oh, I did a great project with my daughters for an Enviro Challenger video where we took soup cans and rolled up paper and put them all in there. It was a um, great way to just reuse products to uh, reuse old yeah. stuff. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to let you know that, you know, Portland, Portland Avenue Nursery, Garden Sphere Nursery, you know, we really are in cahoots with each other. We talk to each other all the time. Um, depending on, you know, who you're closer to, um, you can give a call, stop by. All of us are super knowledgeable in, in fruit tree and fruit tree care. Um, so don't hesitate to call. Oh, uh, two more questions. Ooh, okay. That's good to know. I, I'm, it's good to know that nurseries are working together. I think it's important. Yeah, uh, it's about it's about helping the, you know, the canopy and everything, right? So. It is. You know, we're we're a community. We really we really do work together. And I know there's a soil soil company that we work with as well. You know, we all kind of talk to each other, and and it's it's so cool. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, that's good. The first question is, uh, do you buy mason bees? And I believe you do not. They just show up, right? Oh, is, you can buy them as well. Oh, you can buy them. Oh, excellent. Can yeah. Um, we carry mason bees. Um, I know Janda, there is a gentleman who he has mason bees and he loves to share them and fantastic. Um, Janda can give you more information on that. Um, I know several different hardware stores have, have now started to carry mason bees um, and they just come in their little, their little cocoons and they're just ready to just put on the end of those tubes and just hang out until it gets warm enough and they come out. So yeah, you can buy them. Fantastic. Uh, the next question is, um, could you talk about apple maggot booties? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. I just whipped right past that one. So um, nylons. So they are basically like footy nylons. And what you do is you put them around the, the apple, okay? So you're, and you're gonna wanna do that when you see that apple form, like it's blossomed, it's got pollinated, and now you have that tiny little fruit sitting there, pop it on. And you're gonna wanna tie it on. Um, you can do a little knot. Um, my mom and I like to use twist ties. And we just kind of, when they're so little like that, we have to twist tie it. And then once they're a little bit bigger, then we'll make a little knot. But really what they are, a little like nylon footy. So if you have tights, or if you have um, little footy nylons, or if you know, you've been to the foot, foot um, the store and tried on lots of shoes, you know, save those little footies. Um, but you can also buy them too. And they come in boxes of um, 144, 288. Um, you can can reuse them, you know, if they're not, get, don't get damaged, you can reuse them. Um, they do help. So what, what my mom and I do on, on my parents' property is we, we do the winter spring, we do the spring spring before the leaves and the buds emerge. With, we do some neem, we, we spray neem oil. Um, once the flowers and buds are out, this is really, really important. Don't spray anything. If you spray anything while those flowers are out, you will see zero fruit. No pollinators are going to come by 
and take some drinks and spread some pollinators, you know, pollen, they're not going to come. They're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. This smells really bad. And we're not coming near this. So you will have zero fruit. Do not spray at all. Once you see those, those buds starting to crack and emerge, you will lose all your fruit. And it's so sad. Our neighbors uh, sprayed all their plum trees and all their apple trees when they were flowering. We went, no, wait. <laughs> We had a bumper crop. They had nothing. I was really sad. Um, so don't spray. Um, but you know, after you that fruit has set, they've got pollinated. You see the little fruits. We hit it again with neem. We hit another another spraying of neem, and then we wait again. And when I'm changing out those maggot balls, I am putting new maggot balls on, and I am doing another hit of neem. I've got my coddling moth traps. I mean, and, and we, you know, when, when our fruit sets, we put the, we put the sleeves on and, you know, it, all of that work pays off. We have beautiful fruit. Um, you can use diatomaceous earth as well to deter um, pests. You can put that around the base and put it on all the branches. Diatomaceous earth, also known as DE. Um, it works fantastic. So there are lots of ways to get, um, large quantities of fruit, quality fruits that aren't going to have maggots and, and worms and whatnot inside of your fruit. And you open it and you're like, oh, oh, oh a little protein. No, oh, no, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. I got a few more questions that have been popping up. So excellent information. Um, uh, I have a disease in the bark of our trees. Is it hopeless? They still seem to produce. Mm -hmm. um, when you should... Uh, when should you not prune a cherry because of the fungal disease spread? And then someone else, I have a billion cherries on my trees, four years old, 98% dried up and dropped off. Maybe you could answer why. Water. What's the most common pest and disease in our area and the treatments? Ooh, so really, Water. for the palm fruits, it's the apple maggots and the coddling moth. Those are the biggest. Well, and then crows, the crows come in and they do all kinds of damage. Um, and the starlings, they do a lot of damage. Um, but for those palm fruits, it's really those, uh, the apple maggots and the coddling moth. They, they do some serious damage. Um, we do have rust and curl leaf. Um, pears, um, pears get the rust um, fungal issue. Um, and then we've got, um, uh, the curl leaf that happens with pears and cherries, uh, plums get the curl leaf. Um, again, you're going to hit them. I would do like a triple action plus type spray with those. If you've got multiple, uh, you know, fungal and insect pests, do a triple action plus spray because that'll hit all of them. Um, the, the fungal in your bark, don't take the bark off. I know that is your instinct to take the bark off. I, 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 I feel it in my bones. Um, <laughs> don't take it off, leave it there. If it is still producing, it is, if it is still at otherwise, other than that bark issue, if it is otherwise a happy tree, just let it lie. You open that up and you're gonna have more issues than you really want. So uh, keep it keep it contained um, in that sense. Um, you could hear, hit it with a, a fungicide. If it is truly a fungus, um, it, it, you know, if you could hit it with a fungicide, um, you know, that would be okay. That would totally work. Um, and there's a lot of real good fungicides that, that are not environmentally de detrimental out there. Uh, you, we've got several um, to choose from. Um, the disease going from one tree to another. My question is, how close are the trees? Because um, if they're too close together and they're transmitting that in that area, you might consider getting rid of one of them. Because uh, if, if they're too close, um, because it's never going to get much better. Uh, they, say, they say they're 10 feet, just so you know. 10 feet. Are they semi-dwarf or are they standard? <laughs> uh, well, we're waiting on that. Also, yeah. uh, flower pruning, is that something you can speak to as well? I can. It really depends on the flower. Okay, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Semi dwarf is the answer, by the way. Semi dwarf. Okay. <laughs> so you, so you, you're going to keep it at about ten, ten to fifteen feet tall ish, um, and you're going to. They'll, they'll probably have a spread 
we're at 10 feet ish. So being that they're 10 feet together at the trunk, if they are also going to have a canopy of 10 feet, and I'm assuming that these are fairly mature if they're that you know, if they're transmitting like that, um, those branches are constantly going to be intermingling. Um, so you're going to want to prune it back. You're going to head those back significantly um, to allow more airflow between those trees. W when I plant fruit trees, I really want to plant them, you know, 12 to 15 feet apart. Uh, if they're dead, if they're semi dwarf, if they're dwarf, 10 feet, eight feet, 10 feet are totally good. But because of that airflow issue and because of transmittable um, diseases in between the trees, if you get them too close and those canopies, especially some of the, the apple trees, you know, they can get pretty expansive with their canopies when they're very mature, you know, say they're 15, 20 years old. Um, it can cause more transmission. So just prune them back more. See if that helps. Get that airflow out there and head them back and prune out more uh, in between the trees and then try to balance it on the other side so it doesn't look wonky. <laughs> uh, the follow up on the flowering was uh, removing some flowers to improve the quality of the fruit that does set. So I imagine it's a lot of flowers on the fruit tree. Gotcha. I, would, I wouldn't take the flowers away. But once the fruit is set, and you know that the fruit is at, say, a medium size, it's not full size, not even close, say, say it's like a fourth of what it will be when it's mature, then you can start taking off the, the, the set fruit. I wouldn't take off the flowers because you never know. You never know what's going to actually set. Um, so you, you, want, you want your biggest bang for your buck. You keep those flowers on there. <laughs> Because you may only get four, four fruit off the tree and you're thinking, oh, <laughs> I took off all those flowers. So but once the fruit is set, though, you do want to thin it out. I know it looks amazing when they are loaded, but then think about the branch weight. How much weight can those branches take? Um, thinning them out, you know, so you then instead of getting a lot of little tiny fruit, right, or kind of uh, they don't taste awesome, awesome fruit. You're getting good size, high quality fruit. Okay, a lot of this energy is going into very specific fruits on the trees. I hope that makes sense. Makes sense to me. So, uh, <laughs> have we reached the end of your per, uh, of your show? Great. Yeah, so these yeah, if there are no more fantastic. questions. Then I think yeah, we're oh, going to there oh. is the the cherry question. Sorry, it's yes. it'll. Uh, she said, uh, Colleen says 98% of the cherries dropped off, yet you said water. She says they are irrigated. Ooh, okay, what too does much that water. that mean? So maybe. It's a, it's a water issue. It's totally a water issue. Um, there's a reason why cherries do phenomenally in the Central Valley and have a struggle here. Okay, so um, you want to get it out of that irrigation path. Um, if it's irrigated. If, if it wasn't getting watered at all, I would say, give it a hit of water, you know, every two weeks. <laughs> but because it's irrigated, it's getting too much. It's getting too much water and the fruit's just going, you know, and, um, and fading away. Um, go through, if you can, go through all of these practices in pruning and doing that pre-treat and then after the fruit is set, you know, treating. Um, go through all of those practices. Maybe if you've been pruning in, um, pruning in the winter, try start, you know, maybe this next year, prune it. You're gonna have to prune it in the winter, but then prune it again in the summer and then get onto a summer rotation that might help. Um, but yeah, try to get it off that irrigation. Cherries do not like wet feet. Fascinating. Our, we have a pie yeah. cherry tree out front. Yeah. That gets no water unless it's natural. And so, yeah, the crows have a field day, of course. Oh, of course. Of We're course. okay with the crows, but. Uh, <laughs> Question, uh, and we'll call this our last one for now. What fruit sure. tree do do what fruit trees do best here, which just don't get what they need to produce? So I'm guessing in the you know Puget Sound. Oh or... yeah, yeah. So I gotta say I cannot speak more highly over Asian pears. Asian pears are they're amazing here. They love it here. Uh, they will produce in good and bad weather. Um, you still have to go through and care for them. You still have to, you know, maintain them, but man, they love it here. 
Um, and they, 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 they will produce for you so much fruit. And you, know, it's some, and you can get some that have different varieties on it. Um, and so you can get ones that are very sweet, some ones that are very juicy, ones that are larger, ones that are smaller. Um, Asian pears are my number one on that list of the easiest to grow. Um, number two, the oddball, the fig. The oddball, the fig, loves it here, can do it here any day, um, not a problem. Um, and then as we move our way down, um, plums. Plums, they love it here. They don't care if it's wet. They don't care if you've pruned them, you know, back all the way to the stump. Pru you know, plums are just, you know, they, they, they could be, you know, in the middle of a swamp and then all of a sudden the swamp dries up and they're like, oh, we have fruit. <laughs> Plums are, and plus they, they spread real easily, right? Um, then I would go down and say um, apples and there are a whole host of apple varieties that do quite well on this side of the mountains. Um, and then pears, uh, the, Euro the European pears do well. There's some really nice ones that do well on the side of the mountains. And then we start going down into those stone fruits. So um, there are varieties of, of peaches that do well. The frost peach is probably the most well known, um, but there are some nurseries, uh, specialty nurseries that do have other varieties of peaches um, that, uh, that have been developed to do well here. Um, there is a, a small handful of nectarines that do well here, and there is a small handful of cherries that do well here. Now with, with those particular stone fruit, it's the heat units, and heat units I mean are dry, hot days dry hot days and long dry hot days. Um, and this is why, you know, in the Yakima Valley and in the, in the Central Valley, they just do phenomenally because they get that heat, they get the long heat and it's dry. There's no water or moisture in the air to damage or get fungal diseases. So um, those would be the last on my list. That's kind of why I live on this part of the side of the mountain because <laughs> I don't do well in the dry heat yeah. over there. Not my thing. Um, uh, so, <laughs> So I, I'll tell you for sure, I've learned so much just by being part of this. So I'm going to have Janda come back. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. What a wonderful, and it's, it's clear you could go on for, you know, you have oh, all these other things. Um, let's touch really quickly on the tree coupon program one more time. Uh, it's currently running through March 31st and you can get, uh, it's up to three trees at $30 a tree, like $30 off a tree. So it's like $90 savings on three trees. So Jan, welcome back. That is um, on the tree coupon. That's good for one time for one household or one property. Um, and you can only use it once. So we've had in the past where somebody bought a tree and then went back and wanted to get the other two. You can't do it that way. You, you go in and you get the one tree or three trees or whatever, you save the $30. Um, <clears throat> you can get the coupons at um, the two um, addresses shown here at cityoftacoma.org um, forward slash urban forestry. Um, mm -hmm. Gives you a lot of information about all kinds of trees and tree growth. And they've got a ton of information on their website. Um, the easier way to do that is to go to trees at cityoftacoma.org. And I don't think that's on this particular handout here, but that's where you can sign up for the, you can get the application and sign up for the um, tree coupons. You can also get those through TPU at um, mytpu.org slash tree coupon. And um, <clears throat> as I said, it's good through March 31st. Um, the trees have to be purchased and they have to be trees. You can't do them for shrubs. Um, there's a lot more information on the websites about those. Um, there are eight, let me pull this up here, eight nurseries participating right now. Garden Sphere is the only one in Tacoma. They're at 3310 North mm -hmm. Proctor. Um, there are um, two in Gig Harbor, four in Puyallup, and one in Yelm that are participating in the program. So you can find that information again on the websites and um, that is eligible for anybody in Pierce County. Yeah. So. Oh, hot tip. So we get our new trees at Garden Sphere in as bare root and um, uh, in uh, February. 
And so if you call and you find out when you get the bare root trees, there are, are um, you, you get them freshly potted in some really wonderful soil that can go right into the ground when you plant. So you don't have to put any, you have to buy any extra soil. You just got it in there or you can just take that bare root tree with you, you know, use the coupon, buy them all like that because they, they actually end up being cheaper to 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 uh, to purchase them as a bare root tree. So that's a uh, that's my hot tip for those trees. <laughs> fruit trees, fruit trees for sure. You yeah. can you can get fruit trees with it. You can get landscape trees. You can get mm -hmm. all kinds of varieties. And if you want to plant in the parking strip between your sidewalk and the street. Um, City of Tacoma does require a permit for that. I don't think there's a fee with it, but they do have a permit required. So you can um, get that information on the urban forestry website. And, um, and then the other thing, of course, is that if you are planning anywhere where you think there are power lines or anything like that, particularly in the street right of way, call 811, um, call before you dig to make sure that, that you're not going to disrupt any power or sewer or water lines or anything like that. So um, this um, webinar is being recorded and it'll take us a few days to get it uploaded, but it will be on the cityoftacoma.org forward slash workshops page. And you can um, get all the information there. If you have other questions, you can get in touch with me um, or through Garden Sphere. Um, you can reach me at cityoftacoma.org forward slash um, EnviroHouse. Well, actually, no, that's not the email. You can get me, if you want to email me, you can do ehouse at cityoftacoma.org. Well, thank you, uh, Jenny Call, for joining us. And thank you, Janda, for hosting this. And thank you, Gator, for, for moderating. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Gator, for moderating. Yeah, thanks. It's a lot of fun to learn on. I'm learning so much with these webinars, so I hope everyone else is too. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for joining Bye. us. Bye. Bye.